into my computer. I'm not writing an email. Checking Facebook, doing all the necessities before I get in. No. <clears throat> well, good morning. Pastor Tubbs is out sick today, so I am filling in for him. I have the privilege of bringing the message this morning. So I'll be in prayer for him as he rests. He told me last night that that was a possibility that he was feeling sick, so it may be possible that he's too sick to preach, but he's probably going to preach this morning. That did not happen. Um, <clears throat> so I want to ask you to be patient with me. Um, as I'm probably going to be rereading off my notes more than usual, um, as I wrote the sermon last night. So, wow. normally when I am doing a sermon, I uh, make a rough draft, and then I change it, and then I change it again, I take away this part. Um, today you get the rough draft, so good luck with that. No, just kidding. Just kidding. <clears throat> um, my, the, the name of my message this morning is Go Tell It on the Mountain. You may have heard that before. Um, <clears throat> a song that many, many Christians love to sing, but a command that many Christians do not take seriously. We're going to talk about sharing the gospel this morning and sharing Jesus with others and what that means and looks like. If you're, a, if you're someone who that topic makes you a little uncomfortable or you often feel some guilt when it comes to that topic, I want you to know one thing, and that is that I am not here to judge you. I am not here to bring guilt to you in any way. I am not here to convict you. The only, my only goal this morning is to empower you and encourage you to do the, the most important thing that God has called us to do as believers. So one question is, what is it that excites you? What is it that gets you, sometimes when you wake up in the morning, you're just like, oh yeah, this thing's going awesome. What is that thing that excites you, that lights you up, that gets you moving? Some things that happen in our lives, um, we just have to share it, share it with others. We are so excited and we want to share it with others. We can't keep it to ourselves. For some of us, it's sports. I don't know if you guys knew this or not, but the Nats won the national or, uh, the World Series uh, this, this year. Um, when that happened, I don't know about you guys, but everywhere I went, to the grocery store, that's the only place I go, I guess, because I can't think of anywhere else, to the grocery store, out to eat, everywhere, everywhere I went to eat, people were talking about that. Uh, if you wore a national shirt, you were going to get talked to. Um, and that was cool. It was cool to see people caring about something, everyone caring about something to talk about it, being excited about that. That was really, really cool. It was cool to see that. <coughs> uh, my four-year-old son loves to get excited about things. If you know kids, man, they will get excited about some stuff. Um, Transformers, someone said. That is correct. Um, he doesn't just get excited. He loses control of his body. He just gets so excited. He already told his grandfather what he made his grandfather for Christmas. Um, if he gets a new toy, he has to show that off. He has to. There's no not showing it off. Especially if you're a stranger in a grocery store, he's going to show that to you or at least tell you about it. This past week, the biggest thing he was super excited about was using the bathroom on his own. And you would be thinking, oh, well, he's potty training. No, he's been potty trained for a while. He just still gets excited about it and wants people to know that for some reason. Um, so there's something that all of us just get excited about. We can't keep it to ourselves. We want other people to know about that. And I think if, if we worked hard at being in God's word on a regular basis, if we spent time in prayer, if we honestly really fostered our relationship with God, I think we would be the same with sharing his gospel and sharing Jesus with others. I think that's possible for every single believer. Let me get back to where I was. <clears throat> especially, especially in the season we're in, especially in the season of Christmas. <coughs> we're going to look at John chapter 4 today. <coughs> Excuse me. John chapter 4. John wrote his gospel, his uh, book about Jesus, his gospel a little bit more differently than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He wrote it differently for a reason, and that reason is found in John 20, 31. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to read it to you. John 20, 31 says, But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John's purpose for this, for this story, for this book, um, and this story specifically in, in chapter 4, is so that whoever is reading that would come to know and believe in Jesus. That was his whole reasoning for writing that. <clears throat> 
John wanted to put Jesus on display and show who Jesus really was. <coughs> so this story is actually the first time that Jesus comes out and claims that he himself is the Messiah. He himself is God in human form. This is the first time that he himself says this with his own words. He's done this so far with, with certain acts and miracles. Um, and there have been many people who have said this of him, but this is the first time that he actually says it with his lips and says of himself. And I think that's pretty interesting. The first time Jesus says why he, he is here on earth and that he is in fact God in flesh is not in Jerusalem. It's not in a big church. It's not to the government. It's not to the Pharisees like we would assume he would do. We would think that Jesus would do this very politically and with authority and to the highest of the Jewish people, the highest of the government to make this claim. But instead, he tells us to a woman, not just a woman, but a woman who really the Jews would see as, as enemies, as people who they, both these people, these different people see themselves better as the other people. But he tells this to, to a, a woman who, is, who is, we would consider as a big sinner and uh, consider, she is very well probably considered an outcast. And this reminds us that Jesus came into the world to save us all, to save everyone. God's love does not, does not favor anyone, but is graciously offered to all. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what your past looks like, or where you come from. Back in this time, the Jews were so, so worried about your rank and, and how you were perceived by the culture and hierarchy. And because of this, they missed out. They completely missed the Messiah, who they were looking for and longing for. Praise God that he sent his son to us. Praise God that he did it in a way that we would have never expected. And praise God that he came for any and every single person who exists. All we have to do is believe and confess our sins. So let's start by reading John 4, 1 through 26. <coughs> Excuse me. John 4, 1 through 26. Then Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, though Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were. He left Judah and went again to Galilee. He had traveled through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the property that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about noon. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, because his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it a Jew ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? She asked him, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who was saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. Sir, said the, said the woman, you don't even have a bucket and the well is deep. So where do you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. Jesus said, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again, but whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never thirst or get thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. Sir, the woman said to him, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and come here to draw water. Go call your husband, he told her, and come back here. I don't have a husband, she answered. You've answered correctly. You have correctly said, I don't have a husband, Jesus said, for you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Sir, the woman replied, I see you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews say that the place of worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus told her, believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. 
And the woman said to him, I know, that, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus told her, I, the one speaking to you, am he. <clears throat> this is such an a awesome chapter. Um, and there's so, so much we could unpack here in John. Um, it could easily fill five sermons. We will not do that this morning, I promise. We could talk about what it means to, to have true worship like they're talking about. We could talk about how powerful a testimony can be and how that can impact. We could talk about how crazy it was that Jesus was talking to not just a woman, but a woman uh, that would really see him as, a, as a, an enemy, a group that Jesus would not get along with. But we're going to talk about two different things, two specific things in this story. Two things that if we claim to follow Jesus, then we need to adopt especially during this Christmas season, because it's something that I believe is extremely appropriate for this Christmas season. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint this morning. I apologize. I feel a little weird not having a PowerPoint, but I'm going to tell you what the certain sections are. There's two, um, there's two points this morning. The first point I've titled uh, Love Unbelievers. Everyone say Love Unbelievers. Love Unbelievers. Wow. You guys are asleep. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Love unbelievers. We learn here that this woman is not considered, we would not probably not consider her a good woman. We would probably not talk to her very much as we passed her and, and may not even let our children go close to her because we don't want them to be near them. Jesus knows this also from the first time he sees her because we see he already knows and tells her about herself. So since we know that this woman is considered we would consider her a big sinner, and she, she probably was. We should pay attention to how Jesus approaches the woman. He does not approach her in judgment. Instead, he does two things. He shows her love, and he shares the gospel with her. In fact, every single time we see Jesus with someone who would be considered unclean or a, a big sinner or someone who we, who we know we shouldn't, maybe shouldn't appropriate ourselves with, he shows them, he, first off, he goes up to them, and then he shows them love, and he shares the gospel with them. This is how we are to treat unbelievers. I'm not saying that all, belie- all unbelievers in our time are, are crazy sinners or anything like that. I'm, not, um, I'm certainly not trying to compare unbelievers now to, all, to certain unbelievers in the Bible, like this woman who, who seems like she might have slept around, or the prostitute, or, or the tax collectors, or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I am saying is that Jesus did not expect unbelievers to act as believers. Jesus did not ex- expect unbelievers to talk like believers. And I think there are many, I've met many believers in my day who I think they may pride themselves on how, how awkward they make it between them and unbelievers. For instance, I was talking to someone a couple years back, and they, they, they started working at a new place, and they started to get to know people and stuff like that. And as they got to know people, they noticed two things. The people they worked with, they, they went to the bar every, almost every, every, every day. They drank a lot. Um, and the second thing is uh, they told me that they cussed a lot. Their coworkers just cussed a whole lot. And so they were very prideful in telling me this. They said, so you know what I did? I went over to them while they were cussing up a storm one day, and I said, you know what, guys? I'm a Christian, and I don't cuss. And I, I would appreciate it if you didn't cuss around me because that, that offends me. She, she was very proud about this. And in my head, I could only think, well, how do you think those people felt after you did that? How little do you think they felt? Their focus wasn't on Jesus. Their focus was on that. You believe you're better than them, and they feel judged now, and they feel little, and they're not going to feel comfortable to you. And now, how are you going to share the gospel with them now that they don't feel comfortable around you? But they were proud of it. Um, So Jesus does not do that. He does not expect unbelievers or other people to act as believers. He doesn't go around. He doesn't say, hey, I'm a Christian, so I'm going to expect others or demand that others unbelievers share the same political views as I do. We're not called to judge unbelievers and tell them how bad they are, show them how much better we are than them. In fact, we're not better than them. The only difference is that we have been saved by God's grace. 
We have been saved from hell. That's the only difference between us, if we're a believer in Jesus, it's the only difference between us and someone who is an unbeliever. That grace has been freely given to us simply because we have trusted in Jesus and confessed our sin to him. And yes, we need to be against sin and share truth. We absolutely need to be against sin and share truth with the world. But we're not to do this by declaring how awful unbelievers are and showing them how good we are at judging them. Philippians says that we are to share truth in love. You should not share truth as a believer unless you are going to do it in love. We are to share truth, or when we share truth, Without love, we place Jesus, meaning if we share truth, meaning if we share people that they sin and that they're going to hell for that sin and that they need to stop sinning without love. And then we do it in the name of Jesus. We place Jesus as a bad taste in their mouth. <clears throat> if I go up to someone and I tell them how, if I just show them how, how bad of a person they are or that I'm just totally against everything they do and what they stand for, and then I do that in the name of Jesus, why in the world would they ever want to follow my footsteps as a Christian? You know the one thing they're not going to want to be? A Christian. <coughs> Sorry. If we pride ourselves on being an enemy of unbelievers, we are essentially priding ourselves on the fact that we are enemies of God. We are essentially turning unbelievers away from Jesus, and then... We're almost glad that we're not going to see those people in heaven when we get there. This is not the heart of God. When it comes to unbelievers, we are to do two things. We are to love them as best we can. And we are to share the gospel with them. We are to tell them how they can go to heaven and give them that hope. So may we see others, especially unbelievers, as God does. Souls bound for one of two places for eternity. Then, may we do something about it. May we see unbelievers as God does. May we love unbelievers as God does. May we seek them out as God does. May we always be looking for ways to love on them in, that, in how we speak and act towards them. May we yearn and may we long to share the gospel, to share truth with others in love. <coughs> so let's go on. We're going to read um, 4, 19 through 26. We're going to read that again. 4, 19 through 26. Sir, the woman, yep, sir, the woman replied, I see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worship on this mountain, but you Jews say that the place of worship is in Jerusalem. Excuse me. Jesus told her, Believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must Worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus told her, I, the one who is speaking to you, am he. So the first, the first point was love unbelievers. I've only got one more. And that is to uh, go tell it. Go tell it. You know, like go tell it on the mountain. You know. Anyways. Um, so first we looked at uh, how Jesus, the example of how Jesus loved on this woman. He did not judge her. He did not condemn her. He did not make her feel little. He did not make her feel dirty. He did not make her feel any of those things. Instead, he loved on her. But he also shared the gospel with her. So now let's look at that. We just looked at that um, example. So we'll talk about that now. Uh, we talked about how there are believers, and there are many believers, maybe many churches who, who treat unbelievers badly. Um, there are also many believers and unbelievers who do not treat. Uh, I've said that wrong. There are also many churches and believers who do not treat unbelievers badly. They may love on them and show them love in different ways. Um, 
There are some Christians, get it? There are some Christians who are a calm presence to be around, nice to be around, uh, a, um, a very big encouragement in your life, someone who you want to be around with. Um, but there are some people who are like this and very loving in many ways, but unfortunately they do the opposite. They may share love without truth. Some Christians want to show love in every way possible except for actually having to have a spiritual conversation. And this is for a couple of reasons, and I understand them. Again, I don't judge them. I understand them. The biggest, I think, is for some reason, many of us believers get super uh, scared of being socially awkward when it comes to having spiritual conversations. Now, when the Nationals win the World Series, and we're going to talk to the people beside us in the booth that we've never met before, and their five kids, and their grandmother, and the person they just met. Um, but for some reason, many of us believers kind of shut down, and we're just afraid of social awkwardness when it comes to spiritual conversations. And I understand that to a point. I, I do. But this is what we're called to. Um, there's a saying that goes around the church culture. Um, if you like the saying, please don't beat me up outside. Um, and I, I don't like the saying. Many of you all have may heard this before. Maybe you have not. If you have not, that's okay. But there's a saying that goes around that and it says this. Share the gospel and sometimes use words. Or some people will say, you can share the gospel just by your actions and never have to say a word. If you're someone who believes this, it's okay if you get upset with me or disagree, but just hear me when I, when I say that this could not be more incorrect. And it could not be more, more different than what the Bible teaches. In fact, a lot of times, man, we can use this as excuses to feel good about ourselves for not, not doing the most important thing that we're called here to do, not doing the most important job that we're called here to do. How in the world can something be real love unless it leads to the gospel? Unless it leads to the gospel. I think the scripture would tell us that it's not love. You've done something nice, and that's nice. You may have given someone uh, some money in their time of need or helped them with a project that they really needed, but unless you've shared with them Jesus, in what way have they really benefited? God gave us that opportunity for us to easily and simply share with them how to go to heaven, and we missed it. Real love means we care for the soul and where they're going to go when they die. The gospel is a necessity for a real godly love to exist. There is a, <coughs> sorry, there is a famous magician slash uh, atheist called Penn Jillette. Many of y'all may have known him, know who he is, and he has a show. He's a pretty funny dude. He's, he's a smart dude. Uh, he's a funny dude as well. Uh, he's really good at, uh, at magic, not real magic, just to let you know. Um, but he did a little video about what he thought about Christians who share the gospel and Christians who do not share the gospel. When I say that, I mean Christians who talk about Jesus with others, Christians who do not talk about Jesus with others. And I have a quote from him. <coughs> he made a video, and in this video he was talking about how he, he did a show one day, and after the show, uh, uh, a Christian came up to him and said, um, didn't have time, a long time, but he gave him a Bible and said, Jesus loves you, and left. That's all he really had time to do. Um, and so he was talking about this story, and then he goes in, and, and, and Penn says, Penn says, and I've always said, not me, Penn is saying this. He says, and I've always said, I do not respect people who, pros who do not proselytize, which we would call sharing the gospel, I don't respect that at all, he says. If you believe there is a heaven and a hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think, well, it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. And then he goes and says, how much, he's an atheist, he's saying this. He says, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate someone to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that. And then he says, if I believed, Penn said, if I believed it would be on a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming to hit you and you didn't believe that, there's a certain point where I tackle you out of the way. 
And then he says, but this is more important than that. This atheist spoke more truth here and shared the gospel in a better way than many Christians have. For me, that was a powerful quote, especially from the source it came from. Someone who doesn't even believe God exists. And you may think, well, Kyle, listen, I don't share the gospel because I don't know how to share the gospel. I just, I just don't know how. I want to suggest to you that it's, it's not a difficult thing. We in the church culture have made this, for some, some reason, somehow we've made this as a scary thing or a, a thing that's hard to do, when in reality it's not. It should be a very natural, easy thing for us. And if it's not, then we can make it that way. Um, if you actually tried, if you're a believer this morning and you actually tried to do it, you probably could. Um, but if you were to tell me, Kyle, I just don't know how to do it, I think if you took 30 minutes, sat down and write it out, I bet you could do it. I bet you could sit down and plan that out and really think of how to say that in a simple way and it not take more than maybe an hour if it took, took that long. That's not a long time. We could do that. But we need to share the gospel very simply. Uh, now, when I say the sh share the gospel, I don't say share the entire book of the, or share the entire Bible. Start in Genesis and end in Revelation. That's not what I'm saying, right? What I'm saying is that we share with them how, shall, how salvation works. We share with them how to go to heaven and what that means. And then once we do that, they can ask more questions. We can point them to different places in the Bible. But we need to be able to, to, to do that. We need to be able to share salvation, how that works. Um, I'm going to do that with you right now. Is that cool? Well, I'm going to do it even if it's not. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <clears throat> this is what I do when I'm talking to someone and I want to share the gospel with them. But, you know, if, if you were to look up on YouTube or, or Google how to share the gospel, you would, you would come up with a ton of different stuff. I have actually never done that. I've just now realized I've never done that. But um, this is what I normally do. I, have, I just have four simple things that I make sure that I say. I make sure that I say, talk about God, sin, Jesus, heaven. God, sin, Jesus, heaven. I talk about God. God exists. He's real. He made us. He made everybody. Did you already know that? You did. Next is sin. What is sin? Sin is anything that's against God. Sin is anything that's evil. Anything that's evil is against God. Because of that sin, and we all sin, because of that, we deserve the punishment for sin, which is hell. There's not a whole lot of hope there, is there? Second, or third is Jesus. But in that hopelessness, Jesus came as 100% God and 100% man into the world, lived a perfect life, and died, took a punishment he did not deserve. And then he overcame death three days later by raising again. Since he was able to do that, the punishment that he did not deserve can cover the punishment that we're supposed to take so that we don't have to go to hell. Instead, we can go to heaven if we, be we believe and trust in Jesus and confess our sins. And from there on out, we, we try to battle our sins. It can be very, very simple to share the gospel. It does not have to be hard or difficult. All it really would take for us is to take 30 minutes and sit down and come up with a plan of action. We don't even have to make up anything. What are you going to make up when it comes to the gospel? You know what I'm saying? We have to make up anything. We don't have to make it flashy. But all we got to do is make it simple. If you're a believer this morning, there's nothing that I just said that you didn't already know. Just take some time and make sure you go over those four things or do another way. Just make it sound simple. So what are your goals for the Christmas season? Did you know Christmas was coming up? Happy Merry Christmas, y'all. What are your goals for the Christmas season? They probably have to do with presents and traveling and not killing your family members and getting ready for Christmas parties and all of that really, really, really good stuff. But have you set a spiritual goal for Christmas as well. Amen. Have you set that? How many people have you, have you had a, had a uh, spiritual conversation with so far? If not, that's okay. Set that now. Set that goal now. <laughs> you know, there's a, lot, um, there's a lot we do on a daily basis that does not have a much impact on the world. And that's okay. Many people 
feel that they may in a job that they feel that they may be in a job that's a little meaningless or pointless or that doesn't have a whole lot of impact on the world. But as believers, we are able to bring impact. We are able to impact our coworkers. We are able to impact our community. We're able to impact the literal world we live in. When we dedicate ourselves to sharing the gospel, we will impact eternity. That's amazing. Are you willing to dedicate yourself to the most important thing ever? The most important story ever and the only hope we have in this world? I would like for you to do one thing, and that is just close your eyes for a second. Do not go to sleep. Just close your eyes for a second. Close your eyes for a second, um, especially if you're a believer this morning. If you claim to follow Jesus, close your eyes for just one second. And just think, when you go throughout this Christmas season, think of those, Chris, those, those, those goals you have, those parties you may go to, the family you may see. Think about those people, and just think about one person that you know that if they were to die tomorrow, they would not be going to heaven. They would be going to hell for eternity. Who is that person in your head? When are you going to see them? And how are you going to share the gospel with them? Social awkwardness doesn't really matter <laughs> at that point. You can open your eyes now. Good morning. Wake up. Um, who is that person? And how are, you going to in, to, to, how are you going to take Jesus and the gospel and put that into your plans for the next three weeks, four weeks, however long it is? Um, how are you going to do that? <clears throat> if you're someone here this morning and you honestly don't know where you would go if you were to die tomorrow, maybe that's something that you think about sometimes, but you just, you don't know. Maybe you would go to heaven, maybe you go to hell, you just don't know. I want you to know that you can have peace about that. And you can have peace about that today. All you have to do is believe, trust in Jesus, and confess your sin. Salvation is free. There is nothing we can do for that, praise God. But it's free, and it's there for you. If you want to have peace about that, man, you can do that today. We're going to have an invitation at this time. And if you're someone who struggles with that, please feel free to come talk to me right now during this time. Or if you don't want to do that during that time, Come find me right after the service and we'll go somewhere and talk for just two minutes. And we'll talk about how you can have peace about the most important question of your life. Let's pray. <coughs> Lord, thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for our sins, God. I thank you for how amazing it is that we can be with you forever, God. When we have no hope, God, I, we are sinners. We, we had no hope. We were bound for hell when we died. But Lord, you sent your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins so that we could spend eternity with you and not pay the penalty for our sin, God. You look at us, you look at believers, and you see us as innocent, not because of what we've done, God, but because of what your son has done for us, God. And we thank you for that. And God, right now we open the invitation. If anyone wants to join the church, this is now they can do that, God. If anyone wants to receive your salvation for the first time, they can. If anyone just has a question about what it means to go to heaven when, when they die, what it, what it means, what's, what, um, <coughs> what it means really when, when we talk about the gospel and what Jesus has done, God, this time is open for them. We love you and praise you. Amen. Please stand. <coughs>